Overtime. The Broncos and Steelers were in a dead heat after 60 minutes, and after winning the coin toss, the ball was about to be in the hands of the most clutch quarterback in the NFL. Tim Tebow threw a game winner in the wildcard round, capping one of the most improbable, truly miraculous seasons of NFL football I or anyone has ever seen. He, in several games, had me convinced he was both the worst NFL QB I had ever watched and the best NFL QB I was lucky enough to witness. Today, we go balls deep into Tim Tebow, which he's cool with since he's now married. That's good sports. Just a few years earlier, uh, from that playoff run, Jacksonville's Tim Tebow was a saintly figure on the Gators roster among a team of less than reputable characters. Urban Meyer, Chris Leak, Riley Cooper, the Pouncey Brothers, and of course, this guy, Aaron Hernandez. As a freshman at the University of Florida, Tim Tebow was a bulldozing gadget player for the Gators, getting snaps in all 14 games and making the most limited appearances as his team knocked off Ohio State in the national championship game. A year later, in 2007, the job was his, and his 55 total touchdowns made him a runaway pick for the Heisman, beating out competitors like Darren McFadden, Chase Daniel, and even Chris Long. But for a player with the burning desire to win, the Heisman was not enough. And as a junior, Tim Tebow made an impassioned speech after a one-point loss to Ole Miss in week four. You know, you're an advocate for uh, saving yourself to a marriage. Do you have any advice for Russell Wilson? Um, Wait, no, that, that wasn't the speech. This speech, this famous speech. I'm sorry, um, extremely sorry. You know, we were hoping for an undefeated season. That was my goal, something Florida's never done here. But I promise you one thing, a lot of good will come out of this. You have never seen any player in the entire country play as hard as I will play the rest of the season, and you never see someone push the rest of the team as hard as I will push everybody the rest of the season, and you never see a team play harder than we will the rest of the season. God bless. Now, Tebow was a man of his word, and he led the 2008 Gators to nine straight wins, culminating in a 10-point victory over Sam Bradford and the Oklahoma Sooners in the BCS National Championship game. That speech was a seminal moment in the lore of Tim Tebow, and I use the word seminal very loosely because this man was the greatest college athlete to keep his hog in the garage for four straight years. But anyways, it was a big moment in the legend of Tebow because it felt like this man could will his team to victory, like he could manifest success no matter the odds. But Tebow was a contradiction. At the time, and maybe still, he was very possibly the greatest college quarterback anyone had ever seen, but there was not a lot of optimism his game could translate to the NFL. He had an unnatural elongated release and feet that were all over the place. He turned his back to the defense too often, and he honestly looked way too jacked to play quarterback. It was almost like never having sex turned his semen into muscle. Now, here's a scouting report on Tebow from when he declared for the NFL draft after the 2009 season. During the Senior Bowl, Sean Lowry of Bleacher Report wrote that, there's not a team in the NFL that would consider him anything other than a liability with the football right now, and that Tebow cannot be considered a first round pick by anyone who does not have an ulterior motive for seeing him drafted that highly. And by ulterior motive, he was referring to the cult of Tebow, the thousands, if not millions of fans he inspired by his very open love for God and his knack for coming through in the clutch. Any team that drafted Tebow knew immediately that they would have a new face of the franchise that would sell a lot and I mean a lot of tickets, and bring them even more notoriety and possibly secure them a spot in heaven, or as Tebow called it, God's postseason. Now in a departure 
from some of the scouts, coaches like John Gruden loved Tebow as a competitor, calling him the strongest human being that has ever played the position and claiming that he could revolutionize the game. I've watched you over the years at Florida and I'm anxious to see the, the changes, the subtle changes that you're making in your delivery. And I just, I just hope you don't change your entire game, Tim. Yes, sir. People expected his hometown of Jaguars who desperately needed to sell seats and maybe even the Raiders to take a shot at Tebow in the draft. None of them expected Josh McDaniels and the Denver Broncos. Tebow was tabbed as a third round pick, a very obvious project uh, quarterback whose athleticism might, might make up for his deficiencies as a passer. Much like how my sense of humor might, might make up for my lack of intelligence. Josh McDaniels had spent one year in Denver and he had already flipped the franchise on its head, trading away quarterback Jay Cutler and wide receiver Brandon Marshall, two pro bowlers, within a year of taking the job. In Cutler's place was QB Kyle Orton, a tall pocket passer in the mold of Tom Brady. If Tom Brady wasn't uh, as good, didn't have perfectly symmetrical facial features, and also uh, had a, an affinity for Jack Daniels, to say the least. Now, we didn't know much about Kyle Orton, we still don't, but it seemed like Josh McDaniels had a type. Now McDaniels couldn't have subverted expectations any more than when he drafted Demarius Thomas, jumped back into the first round of the 2010 draft and pulled the trigger on Tebow with the 25th overall pick, parting ways with a third and fourth rounder to move up and take the lefty before night one of the draft was over. It was definitely exciting. Now Tebow was drafted after Sam Bradford, who he had vanquished on the biggest stage, and he was drafted 23 picks before Jimmy Clausen, a player that will haunt Mel Kuyper for the rest of his days. Who in the hell is Mel Kuyper in a way? Despite not being expected to start as a rookie, Tebow set an NFL draft record for jersey sales immediately, proving the cult of Tebow had now made a foothold in the Rocky Mountains. Crazy people in the mountains, what could go wrong? That's uh, Ted Kaczynski, by the way. Now, for most of his first season, Tebow was a gadget player brought in at the goal line and in short yardage situations, and he was usually yielding results. And after Josh McDaniels was fired late in the season for being Josh McDaniels, interim head coach Eric Studisville basically said, fuck it, let's see what we have in this guy. And if anyone could see Tebow's potential, it would be the running backs coach, right? And as it turns out, Tebow looked pretty solid for a player who couldn't throw. Not bad for a running back. And was tasked with leading a three-win team. Tebow actually averaged eight yards per attempt as a rookie, despite only completing half of his passes. Basically, that man went out and slung the rock. His passes at times could look ugly or sinful, and at other times, it just worked. It was holy. Tebow also showed his proclivity for the comeback, notching his first win against the Houston Texans, who also <laughs> gave us false hope about Drew Locke, erasing a 17 0 halftime deficit and claiming the fourth quarter as Tebow time. There's only one person that carries the ball right here. Things looked promising for a rookie who had entered the league with the million question marks, but everything turned upside down when the Broncos brought in a new head coach and a new general manager. I'm talking about Double John. Thank you to John Elway, or John Elway, John Fox. John Fox and John Elway. Neither had ties to Tebow. To them, he might as well have been 240 pounds of dead weight. They showed too that they weren't committed to Tebow when Kyle Orton was named the week one starter. And Orton, well, he just didn't look good. He was boring as fuck. Orton was essentially the anti-Tebow. All we knew of him off the field were those images of him pounding whiskey. I think I'll do a wraparound. 
but he had prototypical size and mechanics. He put up good looking, but very empty numbers, rarely coming through at the end of games or when it mattered. Orton was really good between the 20s, but struggled in the red zone when the field was compressed. It was kind of a joke at the time that Orton should be the quarterback until the team got in the red zone and then the Broncos should switch to Tebow, which actually probably would have won him a Super Bowl. But there was a groundswell for Tebow, and when the Broncos started the year one and three, the second year QB was inserted into the lineup mid-game and nearly came back to beat the San Diego Chargers. It did not happen, but even at one and four, Broncos country knew there was no going back. A week later, in his native Florida, Tebow pulled off the near impossible, coming back to erase a 15 to zero hole in Miami in the last three minutes of the game. It took two touchdowns, an onside kick, and a two point conversion, but the Broncos forced overtime and won the game on a clutch turnover and a 52 yarder from kicker Matt Prater. That was the first real taste of Tebow mania for me. Sure, Tebow wasn't responsible for the onside kick recovery, but it felt like anything was possible when Tebow was on the field. The Detroit Lions brought Denver back down to earth, uh, trouncing the Broncos 45 to 10 at mile high a week later. Maybe the Dolphins' win was just a flash in the pan, or maybe this loss would be his Ole Miss moment in the NFL. Because after that point, what happened? Just six straight wins for the Broncos, and they all felt more improbable than the last. Denver had retooled its offense to incorporate more read options, power options. They put the load on Tebow and Willis McGahee's rushing abilities, and they threw only when the coverage dictated it. Essentially, offensive coordinator Mike McCoy had scrapped his playbook mid-season and started over, catering to Tebow's unique skill set. You know, like good coaches should do. The Broncos blasted through the Raiders in the black hole as Tebow ran for 118 yards and threw for a pair of scores. The defense feasted on Carson Palmer, the new Raiders QB, with corner champ Bailey notching a pair of interceptions and undrafted free agent Chris Harris getting his first NFL pick as well. It was much tougher sledding though a week later in Arrowhead. Denver had lost all of their active running backs and were giving carries to fullback Spencer Larson out of the backfield. Tebow threw the ball just eight times, completing only two passes. It didn't matter because one of those was right on the money to Eric Decker for a touchdown that was ultimately the difference in a tight game. Tebow defeating Kansas City with just two completions is the real reason the Broncos are currently uh, not allowed to beat the Chiefs. That's the piper we're paying. Just four days later, Tebow was on prime time for the first time in the NFL and needing a 95 yard drive to beat the New York Jets with less than six minutes on the clock. He delivered and turned mile high into a madhouse with under a minute left. Tebow converted the first three first downs with his legs, threw one and then made Rex Ryan's Jets pay with a 20 yard TD rip on third and four. The best part is John Elway's reaction or lack thereof in the booth when Tebow scored. That's the face of a man watching a guy he knows is not a good QB, but also is finding weird ways to win at the end of games. Tebow is Elway without any of the arm talent. Rookie edge rusher Von Miller, still figuring out his sack dance, closed the door, sacking Mark Sanchez, and effectively ended the heyday of the Jets under Rex Ryan in one fell swoop. Halfway through that six game winning streak, Tebow had become not just the biggest story in the sports world, but a national sensation. Skip Bayless and Stephen A. Smith debated his merits for weeks, even having my friend Chad Neat on their show with his Tebow song. He's a playmaker and a shot caller in case you didn't know. I can Tebow to shatter the mold and all he does is win, all he does is win games. That was a riff on this famous Skip Bayless remix. I got Tebow, he shattered the mold and all he does is win, all, all, all he does is win games. God, I miss old YouTube. People were Tebowing on social media and thousands were converting to Christianity. 
I don't, well, I don't know if that last part is true, but it seems like it is. Tebow was so powerful, the NFL actually encouraged his kneeling. They encouraged it. Poor Kaepernick. Now, Tebow went into San Diego and set up Matt Prater for a game winner in overtime to defeat fellow non-cuss word sayer Phillip Rivers, and it felt like Denver could legitimately have a shot to win the division. In Minnesota, Tebow looked like a legit quarterback, putting up a passer rating of 149 and throwing two touchdowns in Denver's third straight comeback win. But it was going to take a lot to beat the Chicago Bears. Denver trailed 10 to zero with two minutes left in the game but some typical heroics from number 15 and an ill-timed run out of bounds from running back Marion Barber stopping the clock in Denver's favor for no reason allowed Matt Prater to tie the game from 59 in the freezing cold. A Barber fumble in overtime gave Denver another possession in OT and this time from 51 yards. And with the aid of some nose candy, Matt Prater nailed a 51 yarder that looked like it might have been good from 85. Just like the Bears, right? Now, out of all the wins in 2011, the Bears' victory felt like it was the most improbable. So many things had to break Denver's way, and they all did. As a Broncos fan, it truly felt like God was on our side. These games were impossible to watch for three quarters, but the endings made them all worth it. Like Power of the Dog, or whatever happens before the sex and softcore porn. Now, Denver had climbed out of a one and four hole and were now sitting atop the division at eight and five. But it was about to get tougher and just flat out bizarre. Denver closed the regular season with losses to New England, to Buffalo, and to Kansas City. The Chiefs had actually signed Kyle Orton mid-season after Denver just let him go. And in a cruel twist of fate, he came back to Denver and appeared to knock them out of the playoffs. Orton, high on bourbon, got the win with just seven points to Tebow's three. But an Oakland Raiders loss had created a three-way tie atop the AFC West at eight and eight, and Denver had all of the tiebreakers. Despite a loss in week 17 where their offense looked truly anemic, the Broncos had earned the right to host a playoff game. Their first trip to the postseason in six years, their playoff drought ending on a three-game losing streak. Pretty cool, right? It was the last time the Raiders would give Broncos country something nice. Now, the last team the Broncos played in the postseason were indeed the Pittsburgh Steelers, who had knocked the Broncos off in the 2005 AFC Championship game. And over a half decade later, they were back for the rematch. Now, we should have known when Matt Prater's opening touchback bounced off the crossbar and landed perfectly at the 20-yard line that this would be a strange, fortuitous, and ultimately unforgettable game. The Denver Broncos had spent the week saying that Tebow was on a short leash, and the media reported that they were one drive away from giving the ball to backup QB Brady Quinn. Jesus, can you imagine? No. Jesus only had eyes for Tebow. Leave a little room for the Holy Ghost, okay? <laughs> Pittsburgh would equally disrespect Tim Tebow with their actions, not their words. The Steelers, the best defense in the league in terms of points allowed that season and yards per play, played zero coverage for most of the game, meaning they were going to play man-on-man -man with the Broncos receivers and pool all of their resources towards stopping the run. So, with no other choice, Tebow let it rip, and it resulted in one of the greatest, weirdest performances from a quarterback in playoff history. Oh my God, was it beautiful. Tebow launches the long ball to Thomas. Demarius Thomas has the catch at the 30-yard line of Pittsburgh. And Tebow going to the end zone, and there is caught by Eddie Royal. Is he in? Yes! Touchdown, Broncos! Second and seven, Tebow down the field. Thomas has it in stride. Tries to get away from Taylor. Cuts back twice on him and takes Taylor with him to the ground at the 13. The Broncos found themselves in a strange position. They were ahead by two touchdowns. The Steelers were the ones who would have to mount a comeback. And comeback 
they did. A 31-yard touchdown to Jericho Cotri in the final minutes was about to send the game into overtime. And oh yeah, that's where we started this episode, right? You know what's about to happen, don't you? Just roll the clip because we've seen it a million times. Demarius Thomas stiff-armed Ike Taylor into the hot magma center of the earth, which is the real reason the course started to spin in the opposite direction, by the way, on one play, ending overtime just seconds after it had begun. Tebow had completed just 10 passes, but for 31.6 yards a pop, and basically that correlated to the Bible passage, John 3.16, which you always see people holding up signs for at sporting events. If you actually crack open the good book though, John 3.16 says that, For God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. Not to get too blasphemous, but uh, it felt at the time like Tebow was the new son of God. And at that point, he had made a nation of believers getting an OT win on the wildcard round. Naturally, it took Satan himself to stop a storybook run. Denver fell 45 to 10 in New England, and the Patriots got so damn cocky that they had Tom Brady punt on third down just for fucking fun. Denver's season was over. And though many of us had talked ourselves into the real possibility of another season with Tebow, the off-season pursuit of the sheriff, Peyton Manning, quickly made Tebow mania feel like a distant but fond memory. Once Denver acquired Peyton Manning, they dealt Tim Tebow to the Jets, but he would never start another game in the NFL. His post-Denver career took him to New York, New England, where Bill Belichick dicked him out of a million dollars by not letting him leave for one day in the summer for a commercial only to cut him anyway. Philadelphia, then he went to television, then to minor league baseball, and finally to Jacksonville, where he briefly played tight end for Urban Meyer in the 2021 preseason. Now it's not hard to make the supernatural winning streak explicable. Denver's defense did the heavy lifting. The Broncos got lucky facing a lot of injured teams down the stretch. Willis McGahee put up 1,200 yards on the ground. Matt Prater was perfect on big kicks. And two great Broncos receivers and Demarius Thomas and Big Dick Decker emerged to become reliable targets for an erratic passer. But if you can't give Tebow credit for what he did that year, when it counted, in close games, I'm not sure you really believe in magic, or fun, or maybe you just take football too seriously. Speaking as a fan, I know I'll never experience another season like 2011. It was a once in a lifetime thing, and even though it was unsustainable from a football perspective, those memories will sustain me for the rest of my life. Especially because Peyton Manning got us the Super Bowl. Tebow time did not last long, but it was a beautiful ride. We did ride, and I'm never going to forget it. I'd Tebow right now, but I'm, I'm pretty sure he trademarked that. Thanks for watching the Balls Deep episode on Tim Tebow. Please subscribe to That's Good Sports for more deep dives on players, seasons, uh, whatever. Let me know in the comments what we should do next. I always appreciate your suggestions.